It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the MMRF. Uh, we've been involved with uh, the uh, studies and, and participation in MMRF for a long time. And because I started doing myeloma work actually back in 1989. And I do have a patient here. I'm not going to mention her name or make her stand up. But one of my patients is here. I was in Wisconsin for nine years. One of my patients is here who's had myeloma now for 20 years at least, wherever she is. Yeah, so how many people? <clears throat> and, and again, I'm not going to put her on the spot, but I think I put her on a Revmed trial back in the early 2000s. She's been on Revmed, I think, for 18 years almost, and still doing well with it. I think this is amazing. So when I first started doing myeloma in 1990, is when I really, after I finished my training, um, average survival is two and a half years. Two and a half years. And how many people here are more than 10 years survivors? Look at that. Yeah, so. <clears throat> You know, this just didn't happen then. We, we didn't really have people that did that. And our drugs then, they really sucked. Um, so you guys may not like the drugs we have now. You should have seen what we used to have. Um, back then, we really did give people chemotherapy. And actually, I'm going to talk about chemotherapy. Everyone else here is talking about targeted drugs. But in transplant, we still haven't got targeted therapy. Um, but back then, that's all we had was chemotherapy drugs. They didn't work very well. They made people sick made their hair fall out without a transplant, and we, the patients didn't do well. And we are truly blessed to have organizations like this that help promote drugs to get to the market to help you live longer and live better lives. So with that, we're going to talk about transplant. So my former colleagues have both told you that there's initial therapy. We need to cool off the disease. We want to get it under control. The drugs are much, much better whether you're on Revimid, Velcade, Dexamethasone, Kyprolis, uh, Kyprolis, Revimid, Dexamethasone, they, they work actually very well. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Then you have a choice. If you're considered a transplant candidate or not a transplant candidate, if you're not a transplant candidate, the current dictum in the myeloma field is you stay on what you're on. So if you're on VRD, Velcade, Revimid, Dexamethasone, you don't have a transplant, the current dictum is you stay on VRD or some modification thereof. You do not stop treatment. That being said, when, they do, when the pharmaceutical companies actually estimate how long people are on their drugs, the average duration of an individual being on Velcade is about six months, and the average duration of an individual being on Revlimid is about 10 months. So we have studies. I, I'm not going over the studies. We have studies that show if you do not have a transplant, you're not to stop therapy. It's not transplant or stop therapy. It's transplant or stay on therapy, OK? First, important point, it's, it's one or the other. It's not the third option of doing nothing is not the option. So it's either do something or have a transplant. So after transplant, we're going to talk, Dr. Kaufman talked a little bit about maintenance. I'm going to talk a little bit about maintenance. So the issue with transplant is that up until 1990s, when we thought we didn't have proof that transplant was better than no transplant. And I have a few slides like this. So these slides on the right-hand side of the slide, you see these curves on these graphs. These are called Kaplan-Meier survival curves. And the line on top is the winner. So whenever I show you some of these slides, if we have, I have a couple of them, the line on top is the one that did better. So what they did, this is an old study done in France. A lot of the studies in transplant are done in France. They're very, very good myeloma researchers. And they compare transplant to no transplant using drugs that no one ever uses anymore. But this was back, back in 1990, they started this study. They published it in 1996. It's like ancient history. But this set the transplant field on, on a roller coaster to go from there on. So they showed that transplant, the line on top is the transplant group. The transplant group did better than the non-transplant group. They stayed in remission longer. And ultimately, this group of patients lived longer as well. Transplant beat non-transplant therapy with drugs we don't use anymore. So why do we do transplants? So melphalan, which is the drug we use for transplant, is the single most potent drug to treat the disease. The single most potent drug. You can take KRD, you can take VRD, you can take DRD, you can take all these combinations. And melphalan, there are three drugs. Melphalan is a single agent, it's the single most potent agent. 
it has over a 90% response rate when you administer it in the transplant setting. Unfortunately, it is a chemotherapy drug, and melphalan will destroy all the bad guys in your marrow, but it destroys everything else in your marrow as well. So it's not targeted. The other targeted therapies we use now really target just the myeloma cells predominantly. <coughs> melphalan just kills. That's, that's the true nature of a chemotherapy drug. It is the most effective treatment for this disease. So it can be done after you've had usually two to four cycles of initial therapy. The injection therapy is the time it's typically done. I'm going to show you some data on whether that should be at that point in time or later. And it is considered standard of care throughout the world. Throughout the world. There's nothing investigational about a transplant. So for this large number of people in this room who have not had a transplant, I want to give you some statistics. There are, as Dr. Cole showed you, there's about 30,000 individuals with myeloma diagnosed in the U.S. a year. Of those 30,000, the average age is about 70. I'm going to talk about older individuals in just a second, more mature people, if you will. Um, but if you take, just take a cutoff of 70 years, that means that of the 30,000, 15,000 are under age 70 and 15,000 are over age 70, if that's the average. Everyone with me? So why are there only about 7,000 transplants performed a year if there's 15,000 people under the age of 70, if you use 70 for a cutoff? So in the Caucasian population, about 55% of Caucasians have transplants that are under age 70. If you're African American, it's about 35% of African Americans are offered transplants. And if you're Hispanic, it's in the 20% range. These patients are usually not referred to transplant centers. Again, this is standard treatment, most effective treatment. So we have less, way less than half the people who we would consider transplant candidates under the age of 70 who don't get it. What about older age group? Because I looked at some of the questions while I was working in the front, and someone wanted to know, well, if I'm over 80 years of age, can I have a transplant? Almost every transplant center in the country will transplant patients up to age 70. Some centers, ours in New Jersey, will transplant patients up to the age of 80. Medicare does not have any upper age limit. It's not an insurance issue. It's whether you're in good enough shape and if your doctor actually sends you to a transplant center. So it's not an age problem. So whatever your age is here, it doesn't matter. It's just you have to be sent to the transplant center or you can't have a transplant. Why don't they send them? A lot of reasons. The, the regular, the standard, the home oncologist doesn't like transplant. They don't think you're a candidate because you're not well enough. But the main reason that most of the, the oncologists don't send the patients to the transplant centers and the academic centers is they're afraid they're going to lose the patient and they're not going to come back. And it's an economic, I kid you not, it's an economic issue. They don't want to, they don't want to lose the patient because what happens is you go to the transplant center, they pamper you, they do your hair, they do all kinds of things, and you get to like, you get to like the transplant doctors and the transplant team because you really have a team just focused on you. And you don't get that in most of the private oncologist's office. So the reason they don't get sent is the private oncologists don't send them because they're really worried they're going to lose you as a patient. So we already covered that. So there's different kinds of transplants. I'm only going to talk about autologous transplants. Autologous transplants are using your own cells. We all have circulating, small numbers of circulating bone marrow cells in our bloodstream. There are ways, which I'm going to show you on the subsequent slides, to increase the number of those bone marrow cells, which we call stem cells. These are not the stem cells that some of our political uh, uh, leadership in Washington, D.C. says we shouldn't do stem cell research. Those are primordial stem cells from, from fetuses and placenta. These are stem cells from your blood, bone marrow. So there are small numbers of your stem cells that are in your bloodstream, and we can increase those. And we can collect them, and we can freeze them. We call that an autologous transplant. The cells are good forever once you freeze them. We've, there's a lot of studies that show that. So you can get them from peripheral blood. You can get them for those patients who do have donor transplants. Anyone here have donor transplant? No? We have any donor transplants? So you can get them from a donor. It could be a related donor, an unrelated donor. Or you can get them from umbilical cord. Transplants called autologous use your own cells. I don't want to even cover donor transplants. And some patients actually get two autologous transplants. We call those tandem transplants. <coughs> 
So you get a couple cycles of therapy. We have ways of collecting your stem cells. We can either give you shots that stimulate your bone marrow to make more stem cells. It pushes the stem cells out of your bone marrow. Or we give you chemotherapy plus the shots. And we collect the stem cells from your bloodstream, either through your arms, if you have big enough veins in your arms, or if you don't have big enough veins in your arms, they put a special catheter in, and you collect it through a blood processing machine, stick them in the freezer, you leave them there till you've had your chemotherapy. Everyone in the world uses the same chemotherapy I already alluded to, melphalan. It's usually given over 30 to 60 minutes, and 24 hours after the chemotherapy is infused, you can actually thaw the cells, infuse them back into your bloodstream, and the little buggers go to your bone marrow, takes them about 11 days to grow. Transplant using your own cells takes about 13 to 14 days. Um, some centers do this as an outpatient. Other centers require you to be in the hospital. If you have Medicare or Medicaid, almost all centers require you to be in the hospital because it all has to do about money and how you get paid. So transplant's not a free walk in the park. As I already told you, the chemotherapy is nonspecific. The most common are, though it, it, it attacks this melphalan, this chemotherapy is transplant, attacks the cells in your body that grow the fat. The cells in your body that grow the fastest are your hair follicles on your head, so you get bald, your bone marrow, which is why we replace it with the stem cells, and your GI system, mouth all the way down to your rear. Those cells get zapped the most. So hair, bone marrow, GI system, and that's what results in the majority of the side effects. So nausea is a, a potential problem. Almost everyone gets diarrhea. These are short-term side effects. If someone should ask me what happens to you six years, seven years, 10 years later, very, very little. There is a very small chance that if you get a transplant that you may develop another problem with your bone marrow in the future, but it is extremely small. Almost all the side effects happen within a short period of time. And usually by four weeks after your transplant, you're probably close to where you were before you had your transplant as far as how you feel and how you act. So two weeks for the transplant, another two weeks to recover if you're under age 70. If you're over age 70, it takes a little longer because everything's slower as we get older. So in somebody at 75, I would tell them six weeks total time, not six months and not six years. So we talked about, and Dr. Kaufman alluded to, all these great drugs we have, VRD, KRD, DRD, there's all these great drugs. What's listed are the abbreviations on the bottom of this slide. And what you see in the whatever color, maroon color, is the response rate. OR means the response rate. And essentially, the drugs we use without transplant have a, essentially a 100% response rate. It's not quite 100, but it's close. When you look at how good the response is, he shows you that reverse triangle, if you will, about how deep the response is. When you look at the depth of the response, the depth of the response is also very good. The chance of getting rid of over 90% of your myeloma is probably in the 70 to 80% range without a transplant. So if you have such good drugs, why do we have to bother making you lose your hair and have diarrhea for five days? Really, who wants to do that? Is it necessary? So they did a number of studies. This just represents one of the studies that was done. So they took a group of patients who were in France, and they also have a group of patients in the U.S. This is the French part of the study. The U.S. study is completed, but they haven't shown the results yet. And they decided to ask the question again of transplant versus no transplant, but using today's drugs. Not that slide I showed you from 1990. We use today's drugs. So patients either got VRD or they got a transplant. So they wanted to find out, do you need a transplant if you get good responses? And the answer is yes. The patients who had the transplant stayed in remission longer than those who did not have the transplant. Okay? There are a number of other studies that prove the same principle, that if you have a transplant, you stay in remission longer. A good question, which someone could raise, is do you actually live longer because you stay in remission longer? And the answer to that isn't known yet because the study is not mature. The COMPASS study from the MMRF also shows that transplant is superior to no transplant. Everyone agrees, yet two-thirds of the people in this room have not had one. And I don't think I'm talking about the caregivers. They probably don't need it. So this is to show you that there's a number of studies showing that transplant is superior to non-transplant. When you look at the 
I can only point one way, guys. I can't point both ways. So if you look at the how long, PFS is how long you stay in remission. If you look at the PFS, what you'll find is that the duration of transplant is in the 12 to 14 month range for the most part. How long you, longer periods of time you stay in remission. So Dr. Coffin alluded to the depth of response. We would like, and I'm sure, I'm pretty sure later on today, we're gonna to talk about a thing called minimal residual disease. So briefly, just so you know, so I can uh, set up my next slide after this one. Minimal residual disease is getting 150 points on a 100 point test, okay? So this is a new technology to measure 150 points result on a 100 point test. That's where we would like you to be. It means that we can't detect anything to one, one cell, one bone marrow cell in a million when you have minimal residual disease. That is our goal. It's better than just saying I'm in complete remission. This is, complete remission is 100%. Stringent complete remission is like 110%. And minimal residual disease is 150% on a 100 point test. So this is a study using KRD, Kyprolis Revlimid Dexamethasone, followed by transplant. And what they found in this trial, looking for minimal residual disease, is that 70% of the patients got 150 points on their 100 point test. Now, can you get this without having the transplant the ant with KRD? And I'll be honest with you, the answer is yes, but it's about half that of likelihood of getting minimal residual disease without the transplant. So transplants keep you in remission longer because they get you a deeper response than you can get without the transplant. Should you have two transplants? If one works, why not do two? So back when I was in University of Arkansas, we pioneered doing two transplants, and everyone got two transplants. Well, that's not really a very um, scientific way of doing it, that everyone just gets it automatically. So they ultimately did studies of comparing people who had one transplant versus those who had two transplants to find out if two was better than one. And this is another study done in Europe. The line on top, again, is the winner. HDM is high-dose melphalan. That's the drug we use. So one is one transplant and two is two transplants. And two transplants beat one transplant across all categories of patients, even those with high-risk disease. And I'm pretty sure there's going to be more, of my, uh, more information for those who have high-risk disease. Everyone who had two transplants did better than those who had one transplant. So if you're in Europe, two transplants beat one. Well, in the United States, we did a comparable trial. And if you look at those curves, they're on top of each other. In the US, two did not beat one. So part of the reason we think, and my colleagues probably have their own opinion, is that in the, U, in the US, every, almost everyone gets revenant up front. In Europe, no one gets revenant up front. So we really think the difference was the initial therapies were difference between the two. So if you don't get a good drug up front, the two transplants compensate for that. But so Europe says yes, the US says no. So I don't know the answer of two versus one. So you've heard a lot about research. You know, this is from the My Multimyeloma Research Foundation. All my colleagues have talked to you about clinical trials. I want to show you one of the very first clinical trials in myeloma to prove a point. In 1958, a group that is now called uh, CLGB decided to do a trial looking, a randomized trial, computer picked which arm you got, and back in the 1950s they thought that uh, urethane, urethane is in floor hardeners and plastics, they thought urethane had anti-myeloma activity. So you can go and you can either chew on your plastic seat or you could take the urethane but they wanted to compare it with uh, a, another drug. So this is a phase three trial. They compared two different modalities. So one was Coke syrup, one was urethane. What they found, the line on top, is the Coke syrup. People were being treated with urethane at that time. I'm kidding you not. So when your doctors at the institutions around here, which are really excellent, the University of Michigan and Carmenos, or wherever you may be going, if they say, well, maybe you should participate in a clinical trial, just think about urethane and plastic seats, okay? Because if you don't participate in clinical trials, we aren't gonna get anywhere. 
All these drugs in the last 10 years, everyone keeps talking about the 10 drugs, they didn't just happen by chance, they happened because people participate in clinical trials. Maintenance therapy, because I'm running out of time. Maintenance therapy, there's, you can have consolidation therapy. Consolidation therapy is like getting two or three drugs. Like if you start on VRD, getting VRD after transplant, followed by Revlimid maintenance. There are some people that think that works. In those two trials, the US trial and the European trial I showed you of one versus two transplants, they also had consolidation or no consolidation. In the European trial, the consolidation won. In the US trial, it didn't matter. Both, of the, both the trials did think maintenance did work. So why do we give people maintenance? Well, we want to keep those diseases asleep as long as we can. If we're lucky, if you go on maintenance therapy, you actually have improvement in the depth of your response. You'll get more mileage out of how deep the response was if you go on maintenance therapy. And ultimately, we want you to live longer. There are a number of trials that show that maintenance therapy improves the duration of your remission, that you stay in remission longer. It's somewhat controversial, and I guarantee if we put my colleagues up here, we're not going to agree on the benefit and overall survival. Would you actually live longer after maintenance therapy? Dr. Kaufman already said to you that if you're having problems with it, you should just stop it. Because, yes, you, cause you, you may stay in remission longer, but if you're miserable, what's the purpose? So maintenance therapy does, stay, does prove that you can stay in remission for a longer period of time. Whether you live longer or not, debatable. So there are advantages, which obviously staying in remission. There's disadvantages. There's costs for those of you who have copay that have donut holes, which I assume there's a good chunk of you have copays, and that copays keep going up, it seems, for these drugs. There certainly is some effect on your blood counts. There is a small risk, if you go on Revlimid, of getting a second cancer. It's very small, but it's there. And then there's the issue of quality of life. Do you actually feel better because you're living and staying in remission longer? Very, very important question. There's a bunch of trials out here. I'm not even going to go over these. It's a mess um, of trials for either before transplant or after transplant. This is a very active area. The most interesting ones out there right now are whether exasimib, nidlaro, the oral, the Velcade-like oral drug can improve your remission duration. Results of that, I think, are going to come out in our national meetings in December. The trial's been done. So maintenance therapy, and the other issue is these monoclonal antibodies, Darzelex or Daratumumab, its impact on keeping people in remission for a longer period of time. So in conclusion, transplant is the standard of care, standard of care all over the world. Maintenance is commonly used. Most people only have one transplant. There may be situations where two transplants is considered. Early transplant, not waiting and having a transplant later is superior to um, waiting to have a transplant. You should have it early in your course, not to say it can't work if you get it later. It doesn't work as well if you get it later. I'm not even going to talk about donor transplants. So questions you should ask and why you had a transplant is actually somewhat disturbing to me. But you should ask your doctor if you're a candidate for a transplant, and if, and if they say yes or no. If they say no, you should find out why they think you're not. The best time is actually after your initial therapy, but you can benefit even after diseases come back. If you haven't had a transplant before, the melphalan still will work. It doesn't work quite as well, but it still works. You need to find out where you can have a transplant. Transplants are covered by all insurance companies, private, state, and federal. We already talked about how long you'll be in the hospital. We talked about some of the side effects. And usually after transplant, we follow your myeloma parameters, all the tests that my colleagues talked about every three months. OK, round of applause. <laughs> we have time for one question before break. We did get a lot, but. Um, the question I thought was that uh, you might want to address is, uh, and, and I'm modifying it just a little bit, is what percentage of patients uh, with myeloma ultimately die with stem cells still frozen uh, at the center, and what happens to those cells after a patient passes away? <laughs> what do you do with them? It's like, I mean, okay, so I'm going to answer that question, but I want to talk about something else first. Okay. Since you, I have the podium, right? So somebody should say to me, I told you all these bad things that can happen during transplant. 
And the, so every once in a while, besides losing your hair, which no one's too thrilled about, I already told you about diarrhea. So the biggest risk of doing a transplant that no one in this room would disagree is what's the chance of dying from the transplant, all right? And the answer to that is less than 1% if you're under 70, and it's about 1% to 3% if you're over 70. So this is very safe. That's actually safer than the drugs you're on without the transplant. Let me repeat that. The risk of dying if you're on VRD, KRD, whatever it is, is actually higher than it is if you have a transplant. Okay? So you should know that. So then the question is about storing cells and what do you do with them. So the, what you do with them after a patient actually expires, the facility can throw the cells out. They don't save them for anything unless you sign. Some of the facilities have consent forms that you sign at the initiation of your process if you want to donate your stem cells if you die. Otherwise, they throw them out. The stem cells are good forever. However, Medicare, if they're really picky, will not let you save your cells to be used two years later. Medicare actually has a rule that you have to use their cells within six months of the time you collect them. So for Medicare, you don't save your cells and say, well, maybe a year from now or when my disease comes back, I'll have the transplant. You may get stuck with that bill for collecting the cells if you do that. So Medicare says you have to use the cells within six months. I don't make these rules. My colleagues don't make these rules. Medicare makes these rules. So the cells are good forever, but if you have Medicare, the, for, for private insurers, and, they're gonna, and you get approval up front, they're not an issue. Some centers will actually charge small amounts of money after a certain number of years that you have to pay. Our center, tell, and I don't think they've ever sent a bill, but they, they sign a contract when we collect their cells that after two years you have to pay $250 a year to have your cells stored. But they've never sent a bill to anyone that I've ever known about, but they put that in writing. So in theory, you would have to do that. So the cells are good forever. They're, they get, they're used, and they, usually we collect enough cells for two transplants, even though we just talked about whether one versus two is the right thing to do. Almost all centers will collect enough cells for two transplants. However, Medicare will only pay for one transplant. One. All right? Somebody's going to ask this. I guarantee it. Medicare only pays for one transplant. You have to use the cells within six months. Are we clear? I don't make the rules. This is the way it is. Private carriers will almost always pay for more than one transplant, and you can store the cells and do what you want with them. So don't get old. <laughs> <laughs>